Special shout out to John Vercher, Armand, Smooth Poser, and Scoots Brodo for becoming our newest patrons on Patreon. You guys are absolute legends. Thank you for the support. This is Sam. This is Kel. And this is Southpaw. A note to our loyal listeners. If you love the show, please support us and help us get paid for our labor by joining Team Southpaw on Patreon. By becoming a member, you'll get access to bonus content like exclusive articles, fight previews, bonus episodes, transcripts of fight studies, and access to our private chat group on Discord. But more importantly, you will help us supplement the cost of the show, the incredible time and energy Sam and I put into making the show, and you'll be giving us some breathing room not only to juggle Southpaw with our day jobs, but also expand Southpaw into other areas. Show your Southpaw solidarity by supporting us at patreon.com slash southpawpod. Warning. This episode talks about postmodern neo Marxism. This is an episode Jordan Peterson and the intellectual dark web does not want you to hear. Be advised. Today on Southpaw, we have parkour instructor and owner of Melbourne in Motion, Kel Glaster. And just for the Americans, that is Melbourne in motion. Hi, Kel. Hi, Sam. How you doing? I am good. So let's just get started. Lots of art forms or movements have a theoretical definition. And I say theoretical because it's always evolving. And parkour is in the midst of evolving in several different ways. And we can get into that uh, later on in our conversation. But in theory, what is parkour? Okay, so broadly speaking, parkour is uh, a discipline of movement that's focused on moving efficiently through any given terrain. In practice, that uh, usually means urban environments, and it means stuff like running, jumping, crawling, uh, balancing, climbing over whatever's in your way to get from point A to point B as efficiently as possible. Um, Clearly, we can think about how uh, forms of movement and training that have that are similar to the modern incarnation of parkour have been practiced for forever, arguably, um, and this is just a sort of modern iteration of it. Um, as it stands, it was developed in France in the in the nineties, around then, in the kind of banlieue around Paris, the small smaller towns around Paris. Um, as such, it was strongly influenced by Méthode Naturelle, uh, which was invented by Georges Hébert. Um, apologies for my French pronunciation to any French speakers. And that was a, was a form of physical training that was a big part of French physical education at the time, as well as various forms of militaristic physical training. Um, it, Méthode Naturelle was developed by a naval officer and was a big a uh, precursor to the Parcours de Combattant, which is the uh, army-style obstacle course. Um, and that obviously is where the word parkour has come from, parkour meaning course, route, or journey, I believe. Don't at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the time in the 90s, the C uh, from par- the French word parkour was replaced with a K just because it's cooler. Um, and in, in its modern form, parkour is part of a kind of umbrella group of disciplines. There's parkour, uh, there's free running and there's la du déplacement, which is just a French, uh, in French, it means the art of movement. 
So those are three disciplines that are very closely related, but do have some um, some differences between them that are important to to some practitioners. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself, Kel, and your journey into parkour. Yeah, great. Um, so it happened uh, a long time ago, and I'll have to go back a little bit into my my origin story. But I um, I was in art school at the time, or just out of. I'd moved out of a studio, and in the in the moving out, I'd done a very silly thing and managed to traumatically dislocate my shoulder. Um, that's unrelated entirely to my parkour training, but what happened at the time was I was told that if I ever did it again, I'd have to have surgery. And that turned into a pretty significant fear um, of me doing it again, which impacted everything in my life. And eventually I realized that that fear had stopped me from doing almost all physical activities. And at one point in that process, I decided that being afraid of things and being afraid of the world wasn't what I wanted and wasn't what I, how I wanted to live my life. And so I started a few physical activities to try and overcome that um, and in the process found parkour. And that's a big part of parkour training is facing your fears uh, in, a, in a constructive way. And so that's what it did for me. And it's, it's been part of my life ever since. Now, tell me about FIG, which is the Federation Internationale de Gymnastique. So my French is worse than yours, but who are they and what did they want? Yeah, it's a big uh, issue in the parkour community at the moment. It has been for a couple of years. So the FIG is the international governing body of gymnastics uh, as a sport. And in and as such we've never had any contact with them and in february of 2017 so um quite a long time ago now they announced via a press release i believe their intention to and this is a quote from that press release press release to develop parkour in order to broaden even further its appeal um <coughs> and in doing so they they signaled publicly that they wanted to turn parkour into a competitive event and inside that into a discipline of gymnastics. Um, so they did signal their intention to get parkour into the 2024 Paris Olympics. Uh, I believe they did try for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, but that never came to pass, thankfully. Um, and that initial announcement was supported by uh, David Bell, and who is considered uh, by a lot to be the founder of parkour, and Charles Perrier, who's another one of the founding figures of parkour. Um, and, but at at the time, it did have the support of those those two, as well as some other key figures. They've all since withdrawn or stepped away from supporting the fig in their attempts to uh, bring parkour under their own jurisdiction. Uh, so almost immediately, there was international backlash from parkour communities, from parkour groups and bodies, and from individual parkour practitioners. Uh, if you wanted to get an idea of that, you could search, uh, say, on Instagram, the hashtags Fight the Fig and We Are Not Gymnastics. So those have been big parts of the efforts against uh, the Fig's intentions. Uh, and another way, if you if you wanted to get a good idea of this whole story is to look at Damien Puddle's blog. Uh, he's written some fantastic uh, rundowns and sort of timelines of what happened. Uh, so following that um, announcement by the FIG, it did lead to the formation of Parkour Earth, which is uh, taking on the role of being a federation of national bodies, a uh, sort of international representative of the parkour community. It is worth noting there are several groups that are attempting to be the international uh, representative body of parkour currently. One of them, the Inter IPF, International Parkour Federation, has signaled some amount of collaboration with the FIG, which is disappointing on a number of levels. Uh, but Park, Park Earth have been taking on the role of fighting the fig on a sort of official and 
legal level level sending cease and desist letters and requesting binding arbitration and other other things like that so um the basic too long didn't read format of that is that the federation uh, that governs gymnastics wants to turn parkour into an olympic sport and a majority of the international parkour community doesn't want that so with the olympics why is that such a concern for the parkour community because i could see some people thinking of that as a good thing yeah and it is important to remember there are some people in the world that do think it's a good thing and there are some people that are interested in that happening um as a general idea of why so so many of us are opposed to it uh the very first one is that parkour is not gymnastics and the fig is attempting to effectively steal our culture, turn it into a discipline of gymnastics and ignore and even contradict the ethics and the culture of parkour in an attempt to basically bolster gymnastics. One of the major reasons that's a problem is that parkour or a founding principle of parkour is that it's not a competitive discipline. Um, And that's what has made it so important to so many people over the years. It also means that parkour has never been codified in the way that gymnastics is. We don't talk about things being effectively done right or wrong. We talk about things being more or less efficient or more or less safe. But you you can't do parkour wrong. And when you turn parkour into a competitive discipline, that's exactly what you're saying. You're saying that There are right and wrong ways to do it, and that's against the founding principles of parkour, in my opinion. Um, Other reasons that it's a problem um, is we train for longevity, and one of the sort of unofficial mottos of parkour is more more bad French pronunciation coming, but (laughs) (laughs) it's être et dure, meaning to be and to last. And we train in ways that mean we'll be training for the rest of our lives, basically. And you can see that with some of the original uh, founders of parkour. They're still moving amazingly well into their 40s and 50s um, at a very high level. And so we train in a way to minimize impact through the body, to um, build and strengthen the body to take on the requirements that we ask of it. And you can see that when athletes get to the level of Olympic training, it's no longer about longevity. It's about getting the most out of your body for a short period of time. So when you add that to some of the um, higher jumps and drops we do in parkour, it's effectively opening up Olympic level parkour athletes, if they ever come to pass, to a whole lot of injuries and chronic problems that our discipline is very careful to try and avoid as much as we can. Um, And finally, another real problem this is, is we've seen this happen with other sports and disciplines. Um, And again, I'll I'll refer to Damien Puddle's blog, but he's looked at when exactly this has happened to other disciplines. For example, um, cycling federations trying to take BMX cycling um, under their wing. There's, uh, I believe, canoeing and sailing were fighting over the governance of stand-up paddleboarding. Um, And there's other, it has happened to other disciplines and it's rarely turned out well. So effectively, we we kind of have seen what's going to happen and it's not good for our culture and for what's important to us. So it's kind of like what uh, neoliberalism does with anything. It takes a culture it bastardizes it and tries to privatize it and then sell it back to you. So do you think at the heart of a lot of this is about private control, profit motive, and making it palatable to as many people as possible and make it entertainment focused rather than having it be about bodily autonomy? Absolutely. A 100%. This is a um, neoliberal and a capitalist ploy. And we've seen it happen with an any number of other subcultures that capitalism will ignore you until you reach a critical mass and then steal what you've made, uh, repackage it and sell it back to you. And we also know that uh, gymnastics has been dropping in popularity 
now there are millions of people around the world that do gymnastics, but um, it had you know the numbers have been dropping, so they're reaching around for something they can grab onto and and use to sell gymnastics as as uh, to sell gymnastics to new audiences. Uh, so it is rather plainly about capitalism and money, and particularly when it comes to the Olympic involvement. Um, I mean, nobody, I think, anymore believes the Olympics is anything but a capitalist spectacle. <laughs> <laughs> and and so that's what they've they're trying to do, effectively leverage the the name and reputation that that parkour has built for itself against the name and reputation uh, or what's left of it of the olympic movement um in order to make money it's it's naked and it's not very thinly veiled at all and it also comes at a time when parkour as a discipline is uh gaining more and more traction so parkour has recently been uh, in the past couple of years has been recognised as a, an official sport in the UK, which means it's uh, and and various other other similar things have happened around the world. So it, it means it's at a point, possibly for the first time, where we're able to access the sorts of support from government programs for what we're doing. Um, and so this is coming at exactly the time when we could access that support and that funding and that and those resources for ourselves but instead uh gymnastics is trying to jump in swoop in and and effectively take that away from us a lot of this is about trying to maintain parkour culture even though parkour culture is changing the culture and consumerism aren't necessarily the same thing and you mentioned previously about parkour originally being a street sport and developed in urban areas. So can you tell us a little bit about that, about um, maybe parkour's origins or about the culture itself and how the urban landscape and that street sport kind of like maybe almost like anarchist mentality informs parkour? So parkour is about connecting with the environment around you, with the city that you live in, and doing that in a way that overcomes some of the oppressive structures of any given environment. So all of the cities around us are built in ways to control our behaviour, to direct our behaviour, and to establish what is and isn't considered to be uh, normal in, in a city space. So when you come to start parkour training, you, you do develop what we call parkour vision, which is a way to see, effectively it does change the way that you see the city around you. So you can see both those structures that are um, in essence oppressive structures and attempting to control your behaviour, but you can also see exactly how you can interrupt that, uh, that form of oppression and play in, in urban spaces. So a big part of parkour training is developing our ability to play, which we've kind of been socialized out of in in a lot of capitalist societies play is something that children do and adults are, are encouraged not to so reclaiming that ability to play and to do it in public space i think is uh potentially a radical act and potentially a side of resistance to um capitalism for me so parkour is uh, something you could call a street sport, you could call it an action sport. Uh, some people don't like the use of the term sport itself because that already implies uh, competition. So some people prefer to use the word discipline um, instead. Now, having you explain parkour to me, I've never thought about parkour in these ways, but it sounds like you know, a lot of times when we're talking about oppressive structures, dominance hierarchy, or even modernism, which is modernism isn't about modern things, but it's about the city and how it's built around consumerism. A lot of times we're making metaphors and analogies and we're being figurative, right? Whereas parkour is literal. You're literally overcoming 
oppressive structures and overcoming capitalism and these structures and the way the city is designed and all these things that are telling you to stay over here. Don't come over here. So parkour is a literal fighting against capitalism. And I never really thought of it that way. And another aspect that you just mentioned is about how parkour is supposed to adapt to you. So whatever context you're living in, talking about your shoulder injury, uh, whether you live in urban areas or rural areas, parkour is supposed to adapt to you versus, I guess a lot of people think about you have to adapt to parkour, you have to become a parkour person. I think we get that from how we do a lot of other disciplines, right? A lot of other sports or even martial arts. We have to adapt to the martial art. We have to adapt to our shoes. We have to adapt to our desk where parkour is not like that. It's about the art or the discipline or the movement adapting to you and your context. So we don't even know how to properly think about parkour or something as radical as this because we've never been trained to think about things in these ways. And so I guess in trying to codify it and turn it into an Olympic sport, then we lose the radical nature of parkour and it becomes just like everything else. Absolutely. I, I think that's uh, possibly the most dangerous part of, of this whole idea of turning it into a competitive sport. Um, there, are, there are and have been competitive events previously, so it's not an entirely new idea uh, to make it competitive. Uh, so that's worth keeping in mind. But as far as something that can provide a sort of form of resistance to some of of the troubling aspects of living in neo under neoliberal capitalism, is that even very simple things like parkour doesn't need any gear. You basically need shoes, and not even that. So, uh, and another aspect is parkour doesn't have set training times. It doesn't have, um, you know matches that you need to turn up to so as far as as a as a physical discipline goes it's something that's very very open to people from all class classes and from all sort of levels of social income which i think is really a, an important part of it so you don't need to have any money to do parkour you don't need to buy anything to do parkour if you are um if you have caring responsibilities you don't need to turn up to the same training time every day. So there are a lot of things, and, and for some people, that very aspect does make it more difficult because you do have to rely on yourself. But there are a lot of aspects to parkour that are potentially radical in that they depart from uh, the standard capitalist way of thinking about these things, which is A, that play is demarcated in space and time. So... When adults play, it's usually you turn up to basketball or soccer training, you do it only in that physical area, and you do it only for the amount of time that the capitalist uh, system gives you leisure time. Uh, and parkour opens that up. You can use whatever space is in front of you. You can use whatever time you have. Um, and you don't have to get anyone's permission to play. So um, I think it is a potentially, it does have, as I said, potential to be resistant to, to capitalism, which is probably exactly why people want to, <laughs> to take it and sell it back to us. That's exactly what I was thinking, because out of everything I could think of, other than doing something as lonely as doing push-ups at home, even then, which is about capitalism, right? It makes me think about Fight Club where I have to go to work and then I'm confined to my home to find freedom, right? I have to do push-ups. So then that isn't even freeing. Parkour is the least cost prohibitive of anything I could think of. To your point, you're right? No wonder capitalists don't like it because they haven't been able to make money off of it or not very much, right? Maybe it's like merchant capitalism where is gym owners or people like that, like very small boutique kind of stuff where you can make a little bit of money, but it's not like international money. It's not this conglomerate. And I think that's what they want to turn it into, or that's what it sounds like. Yeah. And um, I mean, one of the larger events that has um, gotten some footholds is the Red Bull Art of Motion. And there's a lot of discussion about the fact that Red Bull, uh, you know, a lot of hate in the parkour community about the fact that Red Bull sponsors that because Red Bull is awful and Red Bull is terrible for you and we train for 
longevity. Um, and so it's, again, another contradiction of our culture. Um, and if it if parkour does become an Olympic gymnastic discipline, then then the potential for that just explodes. It could it can be used to to sell anything. You could have all kinds of sponsors. It really reminds me of uh, the concept that is rarely brought up, which is Marxist theory about freedom. Which is that the whole point of all of this socialism and everything isn't so we could be the ultimate super soldier worker. Is so that we don't have to work that much and make things more efficient so we have more time to pursue our own interests, to pursue leisure, to pursue the humanity, self-expression. And we don't have to be confined in these like spaces where, okay, over here, you're allowed to do this. Over there, you're allowed to do that. No, like you're allowed to do what you want. And so that's the aspect of Marx that people miss is that we come together as a collective so that we could all fight for our individual freedom, meaning at work, we're collective, we're unionized or whatever it is, right? So we have maximum rights so that therefore outside of work, then we could all be individuals and do what we want and do parkour or do martial arts or whatever. Yeah. And, and be bad at it or, or not do it, um, to be, uh, to beat anyone. So part of, part of not, being competitive is that you don't have to reach any pre-described level uh to to do parkour that every everybody that does parkour does it uh to the same level almost because it's about a personal um personal journey of pro progress basically um and capitalism dovetails very well with competitive sport in a lot of ways because yeah. it it assigns value to certain people's experiences in a in a hierarchical way um, but as far as that sort of Marxist analysis goes, you can also do a kind of, I suppose, quick and dirty class analysis of, of why parkour did develop in France. Um, because at the time and still, it is a society that has, a, has had a lot more social support than, say, somewhere like America. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and so, you know, uh, young people who are maybe unemployed uh, are not destitute or young people who need healthcare know that they're going to get it. So in case you sprain your ankle or whatever, you know that it's not going to mean uh, destitution or desperation. Um, and also, I mean, if you go to, to Paris uh, and around the areas of, of social housing and, and lower income areas, there's still a lot of infrastructure that has been cared for and had thought put into it. So those areas do have more interesting architecture than than ones that are that are in less supportive and and less um, socialist leaning countries. Uh, so so the, it is a very much part of how parkour developed is is that sort of um, Marxist idea. In my opinion, I'm sure yeah. a lot of people will disagree with me there, but it's it's been there from the very beginning. They're always in that type of society. Maybe sometimes don't even see how it has that class component to it because they've never lived in America first, right? They're just like, no, it, it's completely unrelated to that. But it's like it's related to where you're from and where you're from is related to class. I don't think something like that would have ever sprung up in the U.S. If it did, it would have been more about not free movement, but about smashing things or something. You know? Or our version here, CrossFit. That's what we would have come up with. And instead of being like, parkour it is about libertarianism and this like unfeathered capitalism and social darwinism and and things like that we could get into that in a second but uh something else that you were talking about with parkour's nature of not necessarily it having to be about competition then it allows for people to have a personal relationship with whatever their thing is, right? Whether it's parkour or going back to what we were talking about with class component or with Marx. When you have leisure, when you have the boot off your neck, when you have time to think about things, you're like, oh, when I ask people about why are you doing here in the U.S., why are you doing martial art or why are you pursuing dance or whatever? A lot of times I think they struggle with their personal relationship with their craft. They have to always give some like monetary reason or competitive reason. And I think you need that class component of support. And that's what Marx was getting at for you to realize, oh, I'm doing this for like personal expression. I'm doing this because it means something to me personally. I don't even do it because I love it. I do it because it is meaningful. We need space 
to realize this. And parkour is so cool in that space isn't just meant to be figurative. It has both connotations of being figurative and also literal, meaning you need a physical space. We need more free room. We can't be all bundled together like livestock. We need room. Yeah. Um, and it is about about public space as well. So you can start um, also bringing into into that you know add on to that Marxist analysis. We can we can tack on some intersectional analysis um, because <laughs> you're just blowing my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is this is a little bit the more depressing side of it. But it does um, because it does take place in public space. It's not always as uh, open to all people or all types of people um, or all sort of visually identifiable um, classes of people. I can imagine that in America, if you're a young black man, you're much more likely to be uh, stopped or questioned when you're training parkour than I am as a white woman in Australia. So, so that is something that, you know, we'll hope to overcome, but we have to recognize that, that that's, that's an issue for a lot of people. Um, and you can also talk about the way that people respond to women training parkour or visibly training outside, sorry, women and other genders rather than, than male people because people don't expect it. I've had a lot of people very patronizingly telling me that I'm going to hurt myself and I should stop doing that. Uh, and, and that is a feminist issue for me. I have exactly the same rights to public space that everyone else does. I have exactly the same rights to public space that everyone else does at nighttime as well. So training, uh, we have to recognize that um, training in public space isn't accessible to all people in the same way. And until we recognize that, we can't change it. Y'all have rights to exist in public spaces. I think that's something that people don't understand if they've always felt that right. Exactly. That's right. And so Sometimes when you're talking to um, the archetypal young white straight man that um, has been training parkour um, and you try to explain what your experience is and how it's different, uh, you know, you can be met with incredulity. They can, maybe they don't believe you because they've never experienced that form of uh, oppression or that kind of uh, the way that onlookers or security guards can control your behavior in a different way just because you're not um, one of the privileged class. It kind of reminds me of how mindfulness is used where it makes people more attuned to themselves or maybe with nature, but not necessarily with each other. So parkour in that same way, I'm doing stuff in nature or in urban settings. I could feel every limb. I I feel myself in motion or I understand nature and I get so like connected to the ground and to the earth. But with each other, that empathy you're talking about to be able to put yourself or even want to put yourself in the shoes of another, it doesn't necessarily come. That's why we need things other than one thing. We still need that humanistic side. We still need politics. We still need philosophy. We still need literature. We still need so many other things to fill in the gaps because especially with physical movement, there is no one thing that's going to answer everything you need. And I so often hear that about physical movement from people who love their art form so much, whether it's CrossFit or martial arts or maybe even parkour where it's like, that's all you need. You know, all my answers were answered with that one thing. And it's like, if it is, then you got problems because you're going to have a lot of blind spots. Like to give you a similar example with martial arts, right? A lot of what we're talking about here, like if we're talking about privileged white men, they teach martial arts in a way where they're talking about a fight. They're not talking about self-defense. They're talking about some kind of street fight. And they always tell you, like, you got to attack first. Maybe they don't always tell you that, but that's kind of a general theme. Like when you feel like you're in danger, you might have to strike first, which if you are a privileged white man, that might be fine. But if you're a person of color, especially in the U.S., if you're a black man and you attack first, the police and everybody watching you aren't going to think that you're the one defending yourself. You have to defend yourself in a way where it's apparent to everybody else that you're the one being attacked. So that's why you got to wave your hands. You got to yell for help. And a lot of times I've heard people making fun of in a racist way, black folks who do that. They're like, oh, look at them always so scared, so whining because they're waving their hands. Help, help. 
And it's like, no, they've been trained that they have to make it apparent, right? A lot of people of color have to make it apparent that they're the ones being attacked that they're not the ones that you should shoot, that they're not the ones you should arrest, right? And that's the thing that isn't taken into account, the account of your environment, the context of where you live and the structures that you live in. And so going back to parkour, then it's the same thing with public spaces. They still exist within a certain construct and you have to think about the constraints of that construct. And if the constraints of that construct is, let's say racist, right? Then parkour, just like martial arts, isn't as available or self-defense isn't as permissible in those spaces. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's a big uh, issue and it seems, it seems obvious, but a lot of people don't, as you said, take that into account when they're, when they're thinking through these things. Um, just to sidebar for a second, I'd like to um, uh, mention the idea of self-defense very quickly because I know a lot of your listeners probably either got into martial arts through the idea of self-defense as well. But I'd, I would recommend to everyone that you, you develop uh, as well uh, skills in running away because that being able to remove yourself from a dangerous situation is, is very important. And if you strike first but then you don't know how to run away, <laughs> then, um, then it's, not, it's not worthwhile knowing that level of self-defense. So um, parkour is considered by some to be a, a form of, of a martial arts that is focused on that, that aspect of um, self-defense, the getting away from dangerous situations. The important part of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the most important part. <laughs> you know, even like martial artists or self-defense people who get it, they go, do this, this, and this. And then they'll even say the most important part, get out of there. And then that's it. And they gloss over that and they get to the next part. It's like, wait, what does getting out of there look like? How do you get out of there? Yeah, absolutely. So I think anyone who is doing martial arts for self-defense should include some sort of version of parkour as well, because you want that to be an a, a automatic response in the same way that you want your self-defense skills to be automatic. Is you want to you want to automatically run away and get the hell out of there. And something I mentioned earlier, but I can't help thinking about when you mentioned gymnastics and this uh, culture where gymnastics is trying to come in and get married to it is, again, CrossFit, right? It makes me think about that. So not in comparison, but has CrossFit culture infiltrated parkour? Have they somehow like intertwined together or have they kept separate? Are they rivals? Like, what are your thoughts about CrossFit as somebody who does parkour? Yeah, um, I mean... I have done CrossFit in the past when I lived in Glasgow. There was a box there that I loved. And I do know some people that do do um, versions of CrossFit training to build up their um, strength and endurance and whatnot. As far as that sort of rubbing off goes, I think uh, just because the parkour community generally is very poor, I don't think it's they've come into very much contact. So but as you know, CrossFit is an incredibly expensive way to train in almost every um, every way that I've seen it, and and parkour people generally don't have that kind of cash, so there's not been there's not been that much um, uh, cross pollination, as far as I'm aware. I do know a few people that that uh, train parkour and love CrossFit. CrossFit is our version of parkour in a capitalist libertarian society. That's the kind of stuff that we come up with. Yeah, which actually I think it was founded near Silicon Valley. And the first people doing it were a lot of engineers from like Menlo Park in that area. So yeah, um, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people really love having a form that you can sort of uh, a form of physical training that you can track your progress sort of numerically. And uh, it frustrates some people who come to Pokemon that they don't have that sort of um, that sort of framework, uh, it is something that's that's a lot more ineffable as far as your progress in parkour goes, and a lot more um, uh, variable. So that is something that does does frustrate some people. But in my opinion, it's it's uh, it's an important aspect of training to be able to feel confident in your own movement without relying on on a set of numbers or or some sort of um, hierarchy there. So this is a natural segue into my next question, which is about, we talked about parkour in theory, right? And I guess that also relates to Marx where it's understood theory and application are two different things. How it looks in the world, it might not 
look like the theory, right? So we define parkour in theory, but the culture also outside of the sport aspect of it with the Olympics, the culture itself is changing and maybe it's always had several different cultures within it. Or maybe parkour itself or the idea, just the way it looks on surface level, attracts a certain type of culture to parkour. So let's talk about that reactionary culture that can sometimes turn physical movements into social Darwinism and street sport has become this return to nature. Can you tell us more about that side of things, if it's always been a part of parkour or parkour attracted those types of people and then they infiltrated and started trying to evolve parkour that way? Or maybe some of the leaders over time started just evolving that way. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting area. I think um, one thing about parkour culture is that it is very widely varied um, and uh, the parkour culture of a of a given city is is often widely different from one a city close by. So as far as uh, cultures go, they are uh, influenced by the communities and you know charismatic leaders in in any given city, but also influenced by the architectural and environmental um, aspects. I mentioned I lived in Glasgow. When you train in Glasgow, it's always wet, so that's obviously had a had a um, had a big influence on the culture there. Um, but as a kind of worrying trend in some uh, individuals and even groups is, as you said, the way that an idea of natural movement uh, can morph into or mutate into a form of subtle or not so subtle social Darwinism. So there are a lot of people at who get caught up in this idea of parkour being natural movement and then take it to very weird places. Mm. And obviously when you're thinking about natural movement and, you know, have, uh, pardon me, I'll start again. Um, <laughs> when you're thinking about natural movement, the first question that springs to mind is natural for who? And mm. when people come to valorize this idea of natural movement, it often means flattening out human experience uh, to a universal ideal, and that usually is flattening it out to the template of a young, fit, socially supported, masculine body. Um, and various forms of natural movement can and and parkour can turn into privileging the aspects of movement that are constructed as, socially constructed as, or coded as masculine. So you have strength or explosive power. Um, mm. And then failing to, or lowering the value of the aspects of movement that are coded entirely socially constructed, in, but coded as feminine. And on that, you'd have, say, flexibility or mobility and even grace. Um, but so... And then that is a value judgment. Uh, but if you use the term natu natural, it hides the fact that it's a, it's a value judgment. It, it subsumes that value judgment under the guise of, you know, quote unquote, naturalness. Um, and, and it's problematic. Uh, I think that we are so far removed from the experiences of what is or is it natural and arguably have been since people first started using language. So any idea of what natural movement is, is a social construct. If you don't take that into, into account and think about that critically, when you talk about natural movement, um, it can so easily lead to stuff like social Darwinism or, you know, Jordan Peterson, right? <laughs> um, and another aspect that I find really problematic is that it undervalues the huge variety of human experiences that aren't able-bodied. So disability is just as natural as any other um, experience mm -hmm. of the world. And it's not something that has to be overcome or minimized so that d people with disabilities uh, can move like natural people um, or move naturally as people should. Um, disability is a natural experience. So that's, you know, a couple of the problematic things uh, problem I have with um, the idea of natural movement. 
And considering that the um, the sort of average, if you will, parkour practitioner is uh, a young man still, numerically we're talking about a, a community that is skewed very heavily towards, you know, early 20s men. It can, I think it's a short step from though from valorizing those ideas of natural movement uncritically to um, falling into sort of traps of thinking uh, that are appealing to that demogra- demographic. So you've got people like Jordan Peterson or Joe Rogan that are taking advantage of the way that these people are, you know, telling these people what they want to hear, basically. So it's not uh, something that's like an official part of anybody's um, thinking or culture, but it is it is something simmering away underneath that I think should be um, should be addressed. Naturalness, quote unquote, like you said, right? It's a cover for sexist ideas or anti LGBTQX ideas or racist ideas or eugenics. And it's used as a cover to say whatever I'm saying is just true and I don't need proof. It's natural, right? It's kind of a bullshit, weird argument where it's like, I'm literally telling you to shut the fuck up because what I'm saying is the capital T truth. That's what they mean by natural. They're saying that you can't dispute it, that this is what they call a priori, which is a truth that doesn't need evidence. And it's like, there's no such thing. Even all of science needs evidence for it to be true. That's how it becomes a science. But it's kind of this like mental trick that they do where if they say that, they try to convince people that there's truths that need facts to back it up, but these things don't. You just have to accept it at face value. And so whenever you have that power to say this is just capital T truth and doesn't need proof, then you could start throwing in all kinds of some of the worst ideas into it. And you could just start evangelizing some of the worst ideas. Along with that, I even like what to your point, ageism and just kind of saying it's evolution. You use sciencey jargon and that works in lieu of actual science and evidence. So to your point, I could see people like you were saying who maybe have an injury or people who are older or excluded because they're not fit enough or maybe their top end isn't high enough for some people. So the instructor or whoever is like, don't even bother. You shouldn't even do it. So rather than being something that empowers people, it becomes, again, about gatekeeping, which if it's about gatekeeping, why did you even start parkour in the first place, right? If it's going to be about dominant power structures and disguising it as natural rather than liberating people, then why did you even start it? Because then it becomes about liberating the already powerful people, the already powerful man, and liberating them to be an ubermensch so that they can return to nature to feudal Europe, right? And they had the money to take vacations wherever they wanted anyway. They could have gone A to B in their private limo anyway. So then... It becomes not only reactionary and fascist, but it also becomes self-defeating. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of potential for um, if uncritical thinking is uh, married with uh, you know high levels of physical um, ability, uh, then then that idea of naturalness does open up the door to to gatekeeping, as you said, and to devaluing the experiences of people who aren't, um, who don't practice parkour in that way. And I think it's really, really worth always uh, questioning what you mean when you say natural, because it's it's a problematic term. Um, and, and also making sure that if you are using ideas like that, you're including people that aren't like you, because it is about uh, empathy and compassion and understanding that the way someone else moves through the world isn't the same as the way you do. Yeah, I don't think it's just a problematic term. I think it's also almost always used in a problematic way because the people who still continue to use it after recognizing that it is problematic are the people using it in a problematic way. Yeah, it's something that has a lot of, I think, poetic resonance with people that um, they like the idea of... of uh, pretending they're a caveman for an afternoon maybe or (laughs) (laughs) yeah no it's the thing yeah um and but also um that uh, that it's some form of escape from oppressive structures of of our modern lives uh but if you don't think critically about the way that naturalness is is used it 
actually ends up uh, reinforcing those ideas, but for other people. So that's the problem. Really, in general, movement without a system of ethics just turns into Lord of the Flies. Yeah, it can. Yeah. And I think that was the point you were making earlier about movement without some kind of critical thought. Yeah, absolutely. And also, also compassion. If, if you're not making efforts to either understand or support other people's experiences, then yeah, it's Lord of the Flies. Yeah. And the thing is, unfortunately, it's so much easier to end up in Lord of the Flies versus something else because everything else requires more effort. And if you're somebody who's always had something privileged or just come from a privileged uh, environment or a privileged class, then you don't even think about putting in that effort to help others because it's something completely foreign to you. And then that in itself is unnatural because in nature, right, it shouldn't be so segmented like that. Yeah. Um, and there's always support for um for others if you if I mean if you were going to think about any natural state of humanity, uh I think it would have to be one that is supportive of people who have different needs. Uh and and if you don't take that into account, then you're being disingenuous in my in my opinion. And I mean also you can think about um not that I'm trying to make a alternative um form of naturalness, but uh the incredible capacity for endurance that that the human animal has is rarely taken into account when these people think about um, natural movement. So when you think about um, stuff like ultra running or, or persistent hunting, um, those privileges that um, young men have, they melt away. So I think that's one area where... Um, the lie of natural movement is is laid bare because uh you know people who are obsessed with natural movement rarely talk about about endurance running no you're right i was actually having this conversation in relationship to martial arts where can you have a tournament where it's genderless where you don't have men and women's division and so then it could also include people who are transgendered or mb where they don't define themselves by either right and I was talking about, and actually other people joined in, talking about where it's either round robin or double elimination or something where you have to fight multiple matches. Not only does that make it more fair, but it takes that initial strength out of it. So if you're doing a round robin or double elimination and you're already fighting a bunch of people, talking about like the things that we praise, right? Strength and explosiveness versus endurance. Maybe you can't beat them the first round, but now you guys are meeting later on where you both had a marathon of matches then it starts taking strength more and more out of the equation and stamina becomes more and more important. Endurance becomes more important. And now flexibility, because the more flexible you are, the more you can kind of rest, right? So these other things. So to your point then, I think tournaments are designed in that way on purpose. They're not double elimination and they're not round robin because they want to cater to strength. And they know that endurance running is a real thing. That's why they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and also as human beings, right? We survive because we're collaborative animals. We not only collaborate with each other, but we've also collaborated with other animals and sociopathic or individualistic species where each individual animal only thinks about itself. They don't do as well, right? So that's another aspect of things, that collectiveness that humans have. They also don't want to give praise to that or highlight it. Yeah, there can be forms of, of um, natural movement that, that are that level of individualist that that sort of have a romantic idea of, um, you know, living in the woods and, and, and whatnot. And uh, there's just no way to understand the, the sort of grand sweep of human evolution that, that has that individualistic aspect. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a disingenuous kind of idea, again. Yeah, it's actually projecting into the past anachronistically uh, what Marx calls alienation, how capitalism creates this alienation. And then instead of thinking of alienation as a bad thing, they're venerating alienation and projecting it onto the past. And I think in the past, when you were by yourself or outcasted, right, it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't to be like the ultimate badass. <laughs> it's like something got fucked up. You didn't want that to happen. Yeah. People like 
Ido or Ido Portal or Irwin Lacour, are they part of parkour? Are they part of that culture and community or are they some other miscellaneous thing that is not a part of you all? That um that is a uh, sort of I'd throw that in the miscellaneous bucket. It's <laughs> As I said, parkour is already a sort of um, catch-all for a number of disciplines, free running and la de déplacement, as well as parkour, uh, very um, very interconnected. Uh, and then I think off to the side, you've you've got um, those those sort of people. So a lot of people are very um, strongly influenced by, say, Ido or um, MoveNat or whatnot, but it you know, most people wouldn't, you know, consider it under the same classification. So they're very closely related disciplines, I'd say, but not not connected. So basically, even parkour doesn't know how to classify those weirdos. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of people love them. And they, uh, you know, they're fantastic movers. They are. And, and you know, all of my um, my criticisms about use of these words doesn't take away from the fact that they have a lot of knowledge and um and good movement to to give to people of of all uh backgrounds it's just sometimes you do have to add your own little bit of critical thinking no it's the same struggle we have in the martial arts community where it might be straight up fascists right who have actually effective techniques but you're like damn but that's a good move what do i do here and you have to separate the physical movement from their ideology, right? Because like the people I mentioned previously, they have problematic ideas. There's a lot of Gracies who have problematic ideas. There's just a lot of people in MMA and martial arts who have problematic or straight up racist or, or fascist ideas, but then they might actually know a couple things about physical movement that are helpful. So there's no good answer. There's no way to get, feel good about it. You just like, okay, that is a, actually a legit technique. So let's take that. But that's just, yeah, I, I think only people in Physical movement can understand that kind of weird negotiation that those of us in physical movement have to make. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, I think people from all sorts of disciplines um, uh, have similar ideas. Uh, I mean, if you're thinking about philosophy, there's um, oh, name is blanking. Who was the Nazi? Martin Heidegger. Yes. Yeah. So, so you know, um, there's uh, there is that sort of aspect of trying to find what is useful and helpful and understand how it's related to the problematic things because if you if you try and take it away without understanding where it came from you know it can respawn um but uh i think it it does come up in a lot of a lot of uh physical disciplines as well as as well as academic ones you talked about how you started in art school first. So let's kick it old school. Back to your art school days, there's a lot of artists that were problematic, filmmakers who were problematic, right? But then you could learn from their art form and their techniques, but then you got to be like, okay, but let's just learn the techniques, but let's not adopt their worldview or copy their habits or physical behaviors that they shouldn't have done. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the way that came up recently in that world was um, regarding Carl Andre, who uh many people have come forward regarding his uh sexual harassment and abuse but he was also uh very strongly implicated in the death of his wife Anna Mendieta who's a much better artist than he ever was um but you know he never got uh uh convicted for that he was charged but but released so you know i i do like some of Carl Andre's work but it i do have to keep in mind that those problems um and also everyone should look up anna mendieta she's a much better artist so well like uh somebody like roman polanski right where if you're in film school do you not study his camera work or his techniques no do you necessarily have to like all of his movies knowing what kind of person he is no but i think for us when we're talking about physical stuff we're talking about also techniques so we have to try to isolate the techniques and the useful bits about how to get something done versus the totality of who they are or even like what they represent, right? Like, I guess it's not a one-to-one -one parallel thing because with somebody who is a, is a fascist, but is really good at natural movement, they don't necessarily have a painting that we have to discuss. So we don't have to give our opinion about whether we like their painting or not, but there might be techniques that is helpful for us to like overcome some kind of obstacle or problem. 
like let's say it's bouldering, rock climbing, a way that you could get from this hole to that hole. And they have a nifty way to get there. But that's it. We just take that technique, but we don't need to take their ideology with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also worth um, talking about how you can make sure that, that your training and your own physical practice is something that lines up with your values. So it's easy to think that physical training or physical movement is something that's separate from you know, values or behavior in, in the rest of your life. But if you think about the way those, those things are connected all the time, you can, you can really move forward both. So, and that involves stuff like thinking about how you can make your group more accessible to people who maybe don't look like you, or think about who are the people that you're following and interested in, uh, their, way of doing things are they all white men um and and if you broaden your own field of influence uh to people who don't have that privileged um experience it can really both help your physical prowess but also uh help move forward with the values that you hold so then what was it like starting parkour as a woman and even starting your own gym? Yeah, it's, um, uh, well, Melbourne Emotion doesn't currently have a physical location, so we don't have a gym um, currently. All of our training classes are done in public space. So hopefully we will, when they get to a point where we can have a gym, but there are some ideological, maybe not problems, but things to keep in mind when it comes to purpose-built parkour spaces. So maybe we can swing back around to that. But starting out as a woman, I did most of the beginning of my training in Glasgow. Um, and I was really lucky that there was a existing and uh, very vibrant and supportive women's community there. Um, and I believe... Uh, Chris Grant of Glasgow Parkour Coaching at the time. He now works uh, in other various forms in parkour, but he was running the first and longest continually operating women's only uh, class in the world. Um, so it was great to have that um, community already existing in which I felt uh comfortable and safe and which I could see people who looked like me uh, doing amazing things. So for a lot of people, not all women and not all um, gender diverse people, but for a lot of us, finding a community that is uh, not focused around the male uh, practitioners is a really important first step in training parkour uh, because people can help you through those those first steps. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that um, going to your first parkour class or jam, just like going to your first martial arts class or whatever, is scary. And people often don't um, take that into account. They think you just turn up. Um, but there are a lot of barriers, invisible barriers, that you have to overcome just to get there. So having uh, minorities well represented in a local community makes it a lot easier for other minorities to join in, basically. So I was very lucky that Glasgow had that community. That said, I, I took on some leadership roles there and being vocally and loudly feminist wasn't always very well received <laughs> and hasn't been in, in the entirety of my time spent practicing. So, you know, I have had to um, butt heads against some of these things and... Uh, not saying I always did it in the best way, but I have always tried to make sure that uh, people can see that there are a wide variety of people in the community uh, and that they'll be supported when they turn up. So that was my experience starting out uh, as someone, you know, in a sort of minority uh, in the parkour community. Now that I think about it, right, not having a gym for parkour actually does make a lot of sense or not needing one <laughs> because you should be out there anyway. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, in almost every city in the world now, you'll have spaces that are either dedicated, purpose built for parkour 
either indoor or outdoor. And often that's in, sometimes you'll see them in inside gymnastic gyms or inside trampolining parks or whatnot, um, but also have a lot of parkour companies do do inside training and it can be very useful and it can be very fun. Like first things first, parkour parks are incredibly fun. It can be problematic in a lot of ways because some people who begin their parkour training in uh, inside never make it out um, and find the idea of training outdoors to be very scary. Like bouldering. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And another thing is, uh, and this kind of comes back to ideas of oppressive urban design as well, but um, if you make a park or park, say, so there's in a lot of cities in the world, there'll be park or parks built in the same way that in the 80s and 90s, people were building skateboarding parks. But, and, and they're super fun and fantastic resources for the communities there. The problem comes when that starts to affect the way that people are allowed to use public space. So it can be that... Just as with, and this happened with skateboarding as well, people start to say, but we built you that park or park. Why don't you go train there? You're being annoying. (laughs) Go to your little spot, the little territory that we gave you, that's yours. And don't bother us. Your reservation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, And that's a problem. That's a problem politically. And it's a problem for the way that people interact with, uh, with their cities, because again, it's demarcating appropriate behaviors. And ideally what we do is, is challenge those and, and come to feel an ownership of our, of our, of our whole city, not just um, dedicated arenas. Uh, so someone who's uh, really interesting to look at on that front is Caitlin Pon- Ponchella, who works um, out of Parkour Visions in Seattle. And she's a urban architect and written a lot of stuff about the way that we design play spaces. And particularly about the way that we uh, do demarcate spaces as appropriate for play, which is which is harmful, Um, and again harmful and supportive of um, capitalist requirements of a good worker. Basically, that's my words, not Caitlin's. (laughs) You said purpose built. What does that mean? Uh, So there are a lot of um, spaces that will make. A park or equipment in the same way that you might make a playground or a uh, you know an outdoor gym or whatnot. So it's it's walls, rails, and other objects that are designed for parkour training, um, and uh, yeah, put in put in spaces that are similar to say a skate park, but for parkour. That almost sounds funny to me because. Building special equipment for parkour when I thought parkour was supposed to be about doing stuff around the stuff that's already existing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so that that is when it can become problematic. Is that when um, so you start to rely on these purpose built things that are exactly the right sort of distance apart and whatnot. Um, and then if you go outside, it's like, oh no, I can't, I can't do this. I'm going to go back to the gym. So it can it can be a really yeah. problematic way to um to begin or continue parkour training at the same time i don't want to diminish the uh, good things about it and the way that it can be really important for communities it is great to have a place that you can go that's a, a clubhouse basically um and also it's worth it's worth noting that um people who have experienced trauma in public space may feel more comfortable inside um and that is an important resource uh, on that front. Obviously, um, women are catcalled relentlessly in some cities, uh, often frightened uh, for good reason. So having a space that is a haven from that can be a really important uh, part of some people's lives, and I don't want to diminish that. But I'd always try and encourage people to, if you are training inside, Make sure you're training outside at least as much if you can, if you feel safe doing so. Kind of reminds me of that kind of dual edge of suburbanism, right? Where it was about demarcating and it's like the city is over here. The urban dwelling is over here. The suburbs 
especially here in the U.S., is over there. And then we have a history of what's called redlining, where they try to demarcate based on race or income level. But going back to just the suburbs, not redlining per se, but it's always been this architecture and the way we urban plan and city plan has always been an extension of a lot of these problematic ideologies and ideas. So with that said, you have the suburbs where it's supposed to be the safe haven for people to flee away from the scary urban dwelling. But at the same time, it is what it is. Now it exists and people do feel safer walking around there. So yeah, I think it's a complex thing to talk about, right? And going back to like public spaces where it's like, okay, public spaces, we shouldn't be demarcating things. You should be able to train outside. But then again, it might also have trauma or there's safety reasons why people don't feel safe out there. It's like, ideally, it should have never existed, but now it does. And and the reasons for them creating it now, they manufactured those reasons. Like now it exists because they created those areas. And so now there's like safe zones, not safe zones. Indoor is safe. Outside is not safe, right? It wasn't supposed to be that way, but now you made it that way. So it's like they made it self-fulfilling. Now we're in the aftermath. It is what it is. So we have to be sensitive to that as well, where it's like, okay, well, yeah, suburbs are problematic, but okay, I, I understand you feel safer there. And outdoor spaces and indoor spaces and confining things to the indoors or demarcating where you can play, that's problematic. But I understand why you feel safer that way. <laughs> it just, yeah, it is what it is, I guess, you know? It is what it is. And it's really, it's, it's incredibly difficult to talk about uh, these things for a lot of reasons, but one of them is the nature of any given city or any given area of a city can be wildly different from uh, any other. So taking into account those cultural and de geographic and environmental uh, ideas should be a part of it. And I think, as I've said, parkour communities do differ wildly because of these things. Uh, and also, like, off often... Indoor spaces are really great because it's always dark outside, you know, if you live near the Arctic Circle or it's always, you know, for a couple of months a year, it's constantly six feet of snow or something. So there are also environmental and geographic reasons that they're important uh, and as well as cultural and um, city-specific reasons. So it's it's really difficult always to talk about the parkour community because Every city and every country does vary wildly in, in a lot of these uh, aspects. I mean, that's just more accurate, right? If you want to be more precise, everywhere is different. A lot of problem with fascism is that you want to universalize everything. You want to make whatever your context is universal to everywhere else. And this is just what the capital T truth is. This is just how everybody is. And so in, in a way, you could even push training outside or in nature make that fascist where it's like, just man up. It doesn't matter if it's snowing or you could possibly get attacked. Just man up and get out there, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, that is the, the problematic end of it. Absolutely. So while we're talking about this aspect of social justice, and you mentioned earlier about leadership, so was starting as a parkour instructor difficult? You mentioned about being a woman, but also someone who is deeply an advocate for social justice. There have been some dif difficult aspects to it. Um, in Glasgow, in the community there, I felt incredibly well supported. Uh, when I did have to move back to Melbourne, uh, often felt less supported and less connected with the existing community here. And eventually that led to starting our own organisation, Melbourne in Motion. So it ha has been difficult at times. And in that sense, I think it's, you know, the takeaway from that is um, it's important to find groups that you identify with, feel comfortable with, and if they don't exist in your city, you can make your own. Is parkour online spaces just as bad as like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu online or some of the martial arts online communities? Um, maybe not as bad, but um, resources like uh say facebook or or instagram or you know going way back there were forums and whatnot were really important um for developing communities uh and now we have join facebook groups that are for say the women's or gender diverse communities in any given city or country 
and there's there's one called Par Queer, which is for queer practitioners to talk about their experiences from all over the world. Um, so there's been some wonderful developments that are only possible because of stuff like social media. But as you know, social media can be a um, an awful place for having any sort of discussions, <laughs> maybe at all, but especially about uh, stuff like feminism or accessibility and inclusion. So uh, just because people will purposefully or accidentally misread what you're saying or attack your position ad hominem or whatnot. So, yeah, social media is a double-edged sword, I guess, and always has been. So you're talking about something here that is new in social media and social networks, actually. If so, for the listeners, if they don't quite get it, what I mean is now we have the ability to create closed or private groups. So it could be just for queer or LGBTQX or whatever, right? Like I have one that are just for people who are left of liberal, who are more lefty in martial arts, right? Then you have two different experiences online. And we have that ability now where before it was all one open marketplace, but now it's like, okay, everything you read in these kind of closed groups can be very positive, right? And then if you go on Twitter or on just regular Facebook posts and you're commenting, then that's like a completely night or day comparison. So I think now we have the ability to just kind of be selective about what we see online. So sometimes we might now not even be aware of how toxic certain uh, disciplines are online because we're not in those toxic spaces online. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, and yeah, th it can be a haven for a lot of people to um, to have those those closed groups. And, and then it's difficult because you can't, you don't want to throw that away, but at the same time, it can be hurtful or problematic if you do have other spaces that aren't as supportive. Like you saying you're a feminist parkour instructor and parkour might be fine. Everybody's like, cool. But if you just said that open to everybody on Twitter, you might get a different reaction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've never much, been one much for Twitter, but um, I have seen some <laughs> some awful blowouts. So it's. Uh... Yeah. Just stay away. Just stay away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm addicted to Twitter, but just stay away. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to then. Melbourne or Melbourne in motion, parkour doesn't seem like a business where, I don't know, maybe it's changed, but it doesn't have like this already pre-existing demand, like let's say some other activities have. Because if there is already a pre-built demand, then you just have to let them know you exist, right? You just advertise your business. Whereas with this, it seems a lot more about educating people about parkour and getting them to be open-minded because they might already have preconceived notions about it because going back to capitalism and consumerism, even though it's not in the Olympics, they saw all this stuff in movies or especially Ninja Warrior or those types of obstacle course races that I don't think have done a good service to parkour. So do you find that a lot of it is about educating people about it instead of just letting them know, hey, here we are? Yeah, it is uh, a big part, I think, of what we have had to do and, and have to do. And I think uh, social media is, is a good tool in that regard because you can share images and representation of all sorts of people doing parkour, uh, older people, uh, you know, queer groups, gender minorities, whatnot. And, and so it can be a form of representation. Uh, within parkour uh, to share to share that representation and and try and change people's uh, existing precon preconceived notions. Um, I think as far as doing that, that is something that um, parkour communities and parkour organizations and governing bodies even have been trying to do for a very long time. So uh, it is very much a challenge to change what people think parkour is uh, and to change who people think parkour is for. Um, and hopefully, hopefully the tide is turning on that front. And, and um, but YouTube culture hasn't, hasn't been sort of the, the best, uh, <laughs> the best influence, shall we say. 
Also, do you find that YouTube has been like something that you guys have had to re-educate people on? Like what they've seen on YouTube more than those TV shows like Ninja Warrior? Do you find nowadays it's more about what they saw on YouTube? Yeah, it does come up a lot. And and there's a lot of fantastic resources on, on YouTube um, for people who are learning. And the problem is that there's also a lot of really terrible resources as well. And <laughs> it's not always the easiest to tell the difference. So that is is probably one of the reasons why we recommend stuff like going to a parkour class uh, because you can talk to people, you can uh, find out their knowledge that they've often learned, you know, from from other practitioners or from themselves who learned it the hard way, um, and you can... <laughs> um, or you know it, it is a it is a young discipline, but it's developing all the time. So sharing knowledge in that way is a really great way to make sure you're avoiding uh, problems that can lead to injuries down the track, as well as you know finding more efficient ways to do things. Um, but yeah, it can be really difficult to if you don't know what you're looking for, tell the good YouTube resources from the bad, particularly when it comes to stuff like. Um, you know, production values because, you know, a, a slick video can make you trust it more when it's not necessarily yeah. slick content, you know. It sounds like parkour has the same problems all the physical disciplines have online than with YouTube actually in particular, where it's always instructors of whatever it is. It could be even uh, powerlifting or weightlifting or martial art where somebody comes in and they're like, I saw... I saw this on YouTube. This is how they were doing it on YouTube. Or I saw this exercise on YouTube or, or this way to do a special martial arts technique on YouTube. And especially with beginners, you're constantly trying to like erase whatever they saw on YouTube. And you're like, forget what you saw on there. Just pretend you don't know anything. All right. Just listen to me. Yeah. Yeah. It can be an uphill battle at times. I mean, I guess that is at the heart of YouTube, that ethos of DIY. It was always supposed to be instructionals, right? Like, yeah, I use it when my toilet is clogged. I, I look on YouTube and they fixed it. So, <laughs> I mean, with simple things like that, where it's like you do this with a chain and you do that and that fixes it. That's a lot different than like learning how to jump over something. Yeah. And the sort of the risk can be lower as well. You're not opening yourself up to um, potential physical damage, maybe, maybe property damage. But so, yeah, it, I think it is important to to try and get it. Um, as much face-to-face -face sort of training with people who have been doing it for longer than you have, uh, if you can. But obviously there are people in the world that, that are in rural areas or whatnot and they don't have that um, capacity. So, yeah, I think always take, it, um, take a, a YouTube tutorial with a grain of salt and maybe always have a look at a few. So if you can, if you can have a look at four or five videos and there's, there's one aspect that they've all agreed on, then, you know, you can, you can maybe move ahead with that. And then if there's one weird thing that only one of them said, you can, you can maybe be a little bit more critical of how you think about that. So look for the underlying principles that everybody agrees on. I think so. I think it's a good way to start. Now tell me about parkour's potential for healing. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something I could, I could probably rant about, um, for weeks, but Parkour for me has been really important as a kind of healing process. And I think uh, there are several areas that I'd like to address in this question, but one of them does spring from its non-competitive nature, that it is um, something that doesn't have right or wrong ways to do things in that way. And I know a lot of people that come to parkour or have come to parkour in their late teens, 20s, 30s, even later, that have in some way been badly affected or even mildly traumatized by the way that we teach physical education in schools um, or the way that they've had experiences with competitive sports in their in their early life that can be uh, can lead people to think that they hate moving or they hate sport or they hate physical disciplines because they hated PE in school basically and Another part of that is that they were forced to, say, choose a gender or compete as their, uh, as as not their gender, especially. So we can think about the way that it it relates to gender expression and sexuality as well. So I think it being fundamentally non-competitive 
uh, has been a really important aspect for for some people who come to parkour late in life, believing they're no good at moving, um, and and that healing that sort of wound that previous um, education has left uh, on their psyches. I, I think parkour has a lot of potential in that space, um, and we can also talk about the healing aspects that it has for self-knowledge and as a form of um, mindfulness, although that that term is is a little bit fraught, obviously, um, as you've discussed before. But um, a big part of parkour training is about the way that you relate to your own fears and your own emotions. So it's a, a way of putting yourself in a position that's not uh, overly dangerous or risky but does put you in a position to spend some time with uh, fears or discomforts that come up in that position. And in that sense, it's kind of like spending time under tension, but for your emotional life. And that can be a really uh, potentially uh, an excellent way to develop your own emotional literacy, as well as developing the ways that you take on those mental and emotional obstacles in your own life. Uh, and so that has been a big part of my own parkour training. I have had uh, major depression for you know most of my adult life, and parkour has been a, a way that I can, in an embodied way, uh, face the way that I am feeling and try and move through with it, if that makes sense. So just for people who might not know what, time under tension is it's an idea that comes from physical training that you could also talk about in a way that's related to mental health but in the idea of physical training you're holding something that's let's say heavy and your time under holding it that time under duress that time under tension is how you build strength so in parkour it sounds like you're making a comparison where parkour traversing and moving through space and actually space and time right? Parkour is moving through space and time is in a way a form of time under tension that can create this same type of effect, but in a mental way. Absolutely. And in exactly the same way that, um, say, your weight training, you wouldn't jump under a 150 kilo bar and try and bench press it on your first session. That when you have these um, practices that are about developing emotional literacy and strength, you start with the the weight, you start with the um, discomfort that is relevant to you. Appropriate. Appropriate, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's not about getting on at the top of a skyscraper on your first day. If that fear or that, or that discomfort is on jumping up to a box that only comes up onto your knee, that's exactly as valid as any other form of, of facing your fears and understanding your own discomforts. So depression has been a part of my life for uh, well, since well before I uh, started training parkour. And what parkour training has meant for me is that I've got a way to both uh, understand how that affects me physically. So I know that um, uh, depression does have an effect on my bodily experience of the world. And I've come to understand that through parkour training, basically. But also through knowing that there's always something I can do. So parkour training is a very broad church. So it may mean that when I am in a depressive episode, I have trouble with jumping because I and climbing because I have sort of um, psychomotor delays. But I can always just do a whole lot of strength and conditioning work. I can also do, say, balancing or flow work. So it's been a way that I can feel that I have this connection with my body, even when uh, my mental health is affecting that. And there's a word you said earlier that I think should be highlighted because I think it's very helpful for a lot of people suffering from depression or maybe anxiety or they tend to fixate or anything like that, anything that makes you suffer on the inside, which is um, the idea of embodiment. And that's an idea that maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with or only recently started thinking about. But it's this um, concept of 
taking an inner feeling and then tangibly or physically expressing it. And I think there's a power to that, that people are just discovering now about how much power that has in healing, like it's healing powers, right? So when I think about embodiment and not having thought about parkour before, I can just see how if used appropriately and in the right way, a feeling that's been stuck inside you can be physically expressed. Just the same way, like I'm sure people feel about dance in particular, right? Absolutely. And I think it's also worth thinking about um, forms of embodied knowledge as well, because um, so there's there's this embodied understanding of your own mental and emotional state, which is a really important part of parkour training for me and for many people I know. But you can also talk about um, what embodied knowledge means, because obviously the the Western canon, shall we say, has privileged uh, knowledge that is written down. Right, and you can read hundreds of treatises and theses on uh, the way that public space is something that everybody has rights to or or the particular nature of what public space means to city dwellers. But if you don't have a practice that is embodied and you don't have an embodied connection to that idea of physical, physical and public space, you're kind of missing out on on most of it, basically. So um, parkour for me as a, as a practice is a really important way to develop embodied knowledge that is uh, not the same as written down knowledge, as as uh, academic knowledge. Yeah, to your point about westernized ideas about knowledge or even mental health, in Asia, when people feel depression, they feel it physically. So Asians tend to feel depression as physical pain. There's also the stigma element. That's a huge part of it. But also it's, they don't feel it as an emotional, mental thing. And so oftentimes like the, the children of these Asians might think, oh, they're just like blocking it out or whatever. But it's like, no, they embody these feelings. So depression feels like sometimes for Koreans, what they call mumsai, or it's like this physical pain. Or if you come from a culture that is more embodied than even things like depression become embodied. And also to your point about knowledge, knowledge isn't just something written down. It reminds me of this quote from an indigenous tribe or one of their sayings is the Asaro tribe of Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in the muscle. I think that's like the perfect explanation of embodied knowledge. So knowledge can be embodied, but also mental health or distress, like mental distress can be embodied. And sometimes when we embody it, then it makes it easier to use physical movement to help with the healing as well. And I think that's why the East has relied so much on things like Tai Chi or martial arts or yoga to try to work through those types of distresses. And I think a lot of people have that um, and it's it's almost removed from their experience by this sort of focus on say um, mind body splits or on um, the privileging of certain types of knowledge in the way that we we exist in the world and it's it's difficult sometimes to even to explain to people that some forms of knowledge can't be written down Um, and that doesn't mean they're any less valuable a friend of mine used to teach um uh, gymnastics to young kids, and one of the best things that that kid said was that one of her kids said was, um, uh, "Everyone should do handstands all the time because when you're upside down, all the sad feelings can't hold on anymore and they fall out." So <laughs> that's that's what I like to do: make sure that they, the sad feelings can't hold on. <laughs> There's like that scene from uh, Dead Poet Society, right, where they all stand on the desks and is to look at the world in a different way, and that's like uh, another way, like. He's making them physically or literally be uplifted. And in doing that, they feel uplifted. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and that's a great example for knowing that forms of embodiment don't have to be dramatic or spectacular. Um, You don't have to jump between buildings. You can uh, balance on a gutter or go for a run or all of these things. You don't have to do things uh, at spectacular levels. Embodiment is often about the small movements or the subtle changes that you feel in yourself. A lot of kids love to hang upside down 
there was at least one kid who always wanted to be upside down on the monkey bars. And when you do it and you're okay with it, you look at the world upside down and just fascinating because you look at everybody in a literal, physical, different way. And then it makes you appreciate them actually in a different way as well. So I think we live in our heads so much, we don't realize how much these physical things can also do things for the way we think about things internally. Absolutely. And also often don't think about the ways that we are um, sort of subtly and not directly told there are things that adults don't do. And one of those is hang upside down from the monkey bus, you know? <laughs> um, so that's a social construct. It's not a rule. It's, it, so if you haven't been upside down in a while or you haven't climbed a tree in a while, I'd recommend giving it a go just because it does change your, your mindset and your outlook. That actually speaks to the oppressive nature of everything, the society we live in, especially as an adult, right? I've talked to friends who have back pain, and I talk to them about doing certain stretches while they're at work, but they're an office worker. So for me, I don't feel like standing up and stretching like your shoulders or your arms are against any social mores, but I haven't been in an office in a long time. But for them, they don't even feel comfortable doing that. So even a minor physical movement, not even hanging upside down, but just standing up and like, doing shoulder circles or like, you know, reaching your tricep over your head and side bending or something like that, they feel like that is too unusual for an adult in a workspace to do. Or even something like going outside for a walk during your break is just unusual or, or leaving the office to go get lunch, physically leaving. So this makes parkour in theory, maybe not always in practice, but in theory, so radical. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we have screwed up a lot of things and, uh, and hopefully we can all find ways to make it better. And, and one of those ways is, is physical training and movement. Um, it is so strange that we live in a world where stuff like not wearing shoes or stuff like even standing at a desk or doing a stretch is something that people feel they're not able to do. It's a very strange world we've made. <laughs> We start kids on that early, right? Just sit there and be quiet and just study. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, you can think about um, some oppressive structures and, and one of them is, is chairs and another one is shoes. You know, these are things that um, can be very useful, but they're uh, pushed to the point of being absolutely everywhere. Chairs um, screw up hip flexors. They um, can... Uh, make certain forms of back pain much more prevalent. They can lower your general fitness and, and posture. Um, shoes often kill the uh, or cause muscles in the foot and lower leg to atrophy as well as change people's walking and running gait. So, so and, and these are things that we force children into from very, very young ages. So these forms of oppressive structures are all around us. And if we can find a way to... Remove ourselves from those, even from a little while. It can be really, really helpful and healing. Going to the good part of mindfulness is you have all those problems waiting for you out there. But for now, just be here now, just for a little bit. A hundred percent. A lot of times, right, we have to conform to our physical activity. Like I have to change to become a martial artist. I have to adapt to my martial art. And I gave the example of shoes. Like we have to conform to our shoes or conform to our chair Parkour is one of those rare arts where it's supposed to adapt to you and your environment. Now that I learn more about it, yeah, I would really hate for parkour to lose that aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, me too. Let's hope the fig backs off. <laughs> and going back to physical health, sometimes I think there's this like idea that's also become neoliberal, like privatized and become a business jargon word, which is alternative health or holistic medicine, right? Where somebody was talking about, oh, I have neck pain or back pain. So they know enough to not just go to a doctor and take a pill for it. I was talking to somebody and they were telling me about how they wanted to go to a specialist who works with physical movement to help with those things, which is great. Two things can be true at the same time. But I was saying like, you could do that. But on top of that, maybe you want to Get a standing desk if you can, if your work will pay for it. If not, get up and do some stretches at your desk. Or you talked about this massager at home that helps you. Take that to work. This is what this person said. No, I don't want to just treat the symptom. 
I want to solve the problem. And she thinks of just physically making herself stronger as solving the problem, right? As getting to the root cause of things. And I gave her this analogy that I actually learned from somebody else, which is the contaminated water analogy where, okay, you're drinking contaminated water. It's giving you diarrhea. You go to the doctor, they give you a pill, you feel better. That's treating the symptom. Now you want to go to a holistic healer or uh, go to holistic or alternative medicine and you take an herb that strengthens your immune system. And now whatever they sold you, because it's not the type of capitalism you're used to. It's more of a spiritual capitalism. You think, oh, now I've addressed the problem. Now I've, I'm not treating the symptom. I've gotten to the core. I've gotten to the cause. Now I'm better. And it's like, no, you still need to fix the water supply. That's the real problem. If you go back to that dirty water supply, you're going to keep getting sick. And going back to Marx, right, the, one of the things that he understood is you have to think about things on an individual level, but also on a systematic level. And I think we're not really trained under capitalism to think about things in a systematic way or think of systems as part of the problem. So if work and sitting at your desk is the cause of your back pain, then it doesn't matter if it's regular medicine or holistic medicine or whatever the hell you want to call it. Maybe you want to call it like a racist term, like Eastern medicine. It doesn't matter, right? You still got to get to the root cause, which is work. We don't live in a utopia where you could quit work yet, but if the nature of how you work is causing you the back pain, then you got to treat it there before it becomes chronic. So maybe even that massager can prevent it from getting chronic or doing those stretches or getting up or leaving your goddamn desk every once in a while. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think also it's, it's uh, indicative of the way that a lot of people think about movement or fitness is that it's something that you need to get into your active wear for and go to a gym and do it there. Um, but the idea, if we're talking about sort of treating it the well, it, you know, walking is a fantastic way. Walk wherever you can, and that increases the amount of um, physical exercise that you do. Or other things like um, getting in five minutes of stretching rather than putting aside 45 minutes for it. And so thinking about movement and physical training is something that that is part of your everyday life making that sort of change is something that can help a lot of people to sort of treat the source of the problem uh in that way but we're not we're not socialized to do that because i mean not to blame everything on capitalism but capitalism <laughs> <laughs> And actually going back to art school, right, where you're from, not just Marxism, but also this is where something like postmodernism or post-structuralism helps, because then you got to kind of like break out of these constructs and these mental models that we have in our head and be like, there are no rules, right? You have more freedom than you think. So, you know, like people, a lot of times they don't want to walk or work out at home or do physical activities wherever they are, because they're like, it doesn't count, right? Because even if you think you're a socialist, you always think it needs to count. You always have to keep score or you have to trick yourself by counting your steps or you have to do it at a designated space. Otherwise, it doesn't count. I didn't do it at the gym. And it's like, no, going back to post-structuralism, just break out of those structures. That's all in your fucking head, okay? You can do it wherever you are. You could be fit wherever you are. You can help yourself wherever you are. So uh, it almost requires a retraining of how you think. And breaking out of these like oppressive mental structures as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you could then um, extend that to the ways that sort of these systems of control encourage people to think about their their own bodies. And often, what that means, particularly for people socialized as women, is uh, self loathing or <laughs> <laughs> like this this idea that you're not worthwhile as someone who. Uh, likes movement unless you have a visible six pack and and matching activewear. So, recognizing those forms of um, of advertising basically as forms of of systematic control that that profit from people feeling bad about themselves uh, can be a really important way to free yourself from them. Um, and that's why. Certain forms of representation, particularly for fat folk or uh, disabled people, can be really important to show that you don't have to be, you don't have to reach a certain ideal to even be considered valid, you know. There's a saying in Korean, 
I give you the disease so I could sell you the medicine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Going back to your previous point about able body versus people who might have physical challenges. So what about that? What about working with people who are not in the best shape or elderly, or like I said, people who have physical limitations or challenges? How does parkour adapt to those needs? Because you started parkour with an injury. Yeah, it's parkour has got so much potential for um all sorts of bodies and all sorts of people. And we've seen that in the in the last couple of years with the development internationally of several uh, parkour classes specifically for older people. Um, we're running one here called Parkour Mature, but um, there are other companies. It, I believe the first one was uh, Forever Young that Parkour Dance did in London, and there's PK Silver who I think are in Carolina somewhere are doing fantastic work on that front. But um, it has been, Paco has a lot of potential for people who are older uh, because it focuses on these functional movements, things like balance, things like the strength to carry your own body around, and also on confidence to do that as well. So we run Paco classes that are, uh, say, at a lower intensity for older people, but the aim is to make them both less likely to, say, fall, or um, uh, but also more likely to have the skills to manage that fall if they do. But more importantly, it's something that I think when it comes to elderly people, the approach taken by a lot of folks in uh, physical training is to treat them as though they're frail and breakable and to treat Part, uh, physical training as something they have to do to uh, avoid breaking. And what that does is it already puts them in this negative idea of what physical training is for, and it also makes it very boring. So um, parkour is something for older older people. I think, again, it's got a radical potential to make both their, their lives better as well as to avoid falling into that trap of treating older folk as as frail and helpless, which does not help with their confidence and it doesn't help with their quality of life, basically. Um, and also when it comes to disabilities and uh, and even training with injuries, it is such a broad discipline of movement that anything we do can be uh, scaled to almost any disability. And so it there's a lot of really exciting uh, training that can be done with people who do have different needs and abilities. And in that sense, um, I'm hoping to develop some classes in the near future specifically for people with disability and or chronic illness and basically to learn from them, really. I think when we do make these adaptive changes to our training, it doesn't make it any less parkour. And, and that's one thing I really want to sort of focus on is that people who are doing parkour at, say, a lower level of intensity or they're doing parkour differently to take into account their disability doesn't mean they're doing a, a lesser version of parkour and it doesn't mean what they're doing is, is less valid as a form of movement. So basically one of the founding principles of, of Melbourne in Motion is that parkour is for everybody. Um, and so we we're trying to develop ways to, to walk the talk on that front. Can you give us an example of what a certain course that you might have somebody who is more mature, right? And they're just starting out. Like, what would that look like? Yeah, the thing to keep in mind is it's, it's very much exactly like every other class. It's just adapted to their own level of um, fitness and strength. So it does involve uh, a short warm-up. It's a little jog. It involves... The forms of joint mobilization um, and checking in with your body that we do with anyone else. Um, we do a lot of focus on um, our landing technique, which is something that the way that we land in parkour is to minimize the impact that goes through the bones and joints and make sure that we're absorbing impact through our muscles instead. So that can be a really important skill for everybody, but especially for older people. And it doesn't always involve a somersault? No, not not always. No, the only time you do that form of break roll is if you're doing it from from height, 
yeah, we focus on the small landings, you know, just jumping off a small step or gutter um, and very slowly building those up. Um, we do a lot of work on developing balance uh, because balance is something that um, tends to deteriorate a bit and less as you age, unless you you do the work to keep it um, to keep it strong. So we do a lot of very simple stuff around balancing, and then from there we learn exactly the same skills, but we uh, you know the same vaults, the same sort of um, hanging or or those kind of actions, but we find ways to lessen the intensity. So you'll do assisted hangs, um, you'll do vaults over very small boxes um, at lower speeds, all of that. It's it's very much the same, uh, the same parkour. It's just done in a different way. And when you're working with people for the first time, do they just immediately have fun? Is there some kind of naturally fun nature to parkour or is it a lot of frustrated people at the beginning? Uh, it's a bit of both. Um, I think the people that self-select to turn up to a parkour class are... Um, already find that sort of thing fun to some extent uh but because because parkour is so wildly varied generally everybody will have something they're very good at and they love doing and will have something that they they feel they're quite bad at and that causes them a lot of frustration one thing that i think is important for instructors to do is balance that level of frustration across all levels so you can look and see that um Someone is feeling frustrated with everything, so maybe they need to try something new to build up their own confidence. And then you can look at someone else, usually a teen- teenage boy, but not always, who um, feels overly confident and is throwing themselves into things. And maybe they need to find something that that uh, is frustrating for them and doesn't come naturally to them. So um, I, I try to to control frustration when I coach, but I'm not always, sometimes I do it too much. So there's this push pull that you have to navigate. Yeah, absolutely. And, and part of that push pull is that people, people will usually gravitate towards things that they're already good at, um, because it's fun. It's fun to be good at things. And sometimes that that can lead to avoidance of the aspects that you aren't so strong in. And it's, it's important to try and, um, challenge yourself, uh, on those areas. Now, talking about getting good and progression, martial arts obviously has belts. Rock climbing can have different grades that you advance up to. Does parkour have a similar system of progression? It doesn't, and um, that's for a number of reasons. Uh, there are a few um, communities around the world that that introduce those ideas, but to get something that is as well developed as belts in some martial arts disciplines you first of all there would need to be some sort of standard that everyone agrees on and it's impossible to get parkour people to agree on anything at all really so that's that's one reason a more sort of deeper if you will reason that we don't have those sort of grading systems in my opinion is that uh once you train parkour for a while you get this this good understanding and an embodied understanding that just because you you achieve or unlock a skill one day, that doesn't mean that you get to keep it. So your levels and abilities will change day to day according to um, your emotional state and the uh, environmental concerns and whatnot. So if you have some sort of belt that says you should be able to do this at this level, um, it's flattening out the sort of responsive uh, self-knowledge that um, parkour training requires. So it's it's often, I mean, one of the frustrating things about parkour, but possibly one of the most, um, the most helpful is that sometimes you'll be able to do a jump and you'll do it easily. And then two days later, for absolutely no reason, it's suddenly terrifying again. And you need to be able to pay attention to those changes in your own state. Um, and in my opinion, that doesn't necessarily uh, if you're relying on an idea of a, of a belt or a grade, it doesn't necessarily mesh together that well. Um, and another reason I would say is that parkour is, unlike gymnastics, it's uncodified. So um, what I like to say in classes a lot is that we don't have 
right or wrong ways of doing things. We talk about ways that are less or more safe and ways that are less or more efficient. So the knowledge that we'll pass on is about um, maximising safety and efficiency, but it's not about being right or wrong in the way that a certain skill um, in gymnastics or other codified sports might be. Um, so in terms of similar sort of uh, things in parkour training, you will find that every city uh, and every community that you go with will have particular challenges that the locals will know about and, and introduce you to. So if you do ever go to a jam or a class in, in a local city or a new city, the, um, the community there will say, oh, can you do that? We'll, we'll introduce you to various challenges. Can you do that jump? Do you reckon you could climb from A to B over there? And they'll also have like legendary ones, um, you know, that X person did five years ago and it was amazing. That's the version of, of, of that kind of idea that, that we have in our culture. Sounds a lot similar to like BMX, biking, skateboarding or surfing, where it's just about whatever you can do consistently. Also with the understanding that you can lose that. Yeah. And relying on whatever's local, like everybody knows about the big wave over there on these days or this one thing that everybody does tricks off of for BMX or skateboarding and parkour seems to be more along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. Which is why it can be fantastic to meet up with, if you're visiting a city, to meet up with um, the local community, um, either formally or informally, so that they can point out um, their favorite spots and, and how to get between them. Um, and also yeah. it's, it's a great way when you have visitors to your own city uh, and you show people a new spot that you've been training at for years and they'll see instantly a challenge that you never even thought of um, just because they've got fresh eyes. So it's a really sort of travel and, and sharing knowledge through travel is an is, uh, important part of, of parkour culture, I think. And I guess when you do travel, if you do parkour, you have a different experience with the city as well. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Are there any people who run parkour who are trying to implement some kind of grading or progression system? Um, not as far as I know. I do know of a few gyms that run a, sort of a, a small-scale version of that, particularly for their kids' classes because, I mean, it works um, especially for kids' classes because it's, it's the version of getting a sticker at, at class, basically. But uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, it's only sort of done on a small scale at an individual community level. I was going to say that's something y'all should never adopt because there's a lot of people in martial arts who are trying to get rid of it. <laughs> so I never understand like, like some Muay Thai is trying to incorporate or have started incorporating belts. And it's like, why y'all incorporating belts? when well, we're trying to get rid of our belt system. It's oppressive. Belt system only is like not that old. It was invented by Jigoro Kano. So every every martial arts that's not even judo adopted it from judo. So they didn't used to have it because it didn't make any sense. And he only did it to get kids into it. And now we use it as a form of gatekeeping and for adults. And it's like and now that type of dominance hierarchy now goes hand in hand with capitalism, which is always about gatekeeping and this perceived notion of meritocracy, right? But I'm glad you all aren't doing it. I hope you all never do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hope it, it doesn't catch on um, myself as well. But, you know, once it goes to the Olympics or becomes more codified and becomes part of a system of competition, who knows, right? Who knows, exactly. What do they call parkour people? Like, is it just... I often use the word practitioner, but um, going back to the French language, the word they use is traceur. Um, so okay. some people use that. Um, I don't generally like using it because it sounds a bit pretentious, but also because French is a gendered language. So you have traceur and traceus, and yeah. I don't don't think it's it's something that needs to be gendered. So I tend to use the word practitioner, which is clunky and and clumsy. Let's stick with that parkour practitioner, right? Because even with things that don't have belt progressions, uh, like gymnastics or boxing, right? You still have terms like that person is world class or elite level or um, a gold medalist. We don't need necessarily belts. There's other ways to demarcate like certain things like that. And 
I'm glad so far right now parkour doesn't have that because once you go down into Olympics and becomes like gymnastics, it will have still a level of progression, like amateur level, you know, professional level, world class level, regional level, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there are people who do use the terms like world class and, and elite, and I've never been that that comfortable with it. And another thing that that does, it um, there are a couple of internationally speaking, there are a couple of uh, challenges that. Have become a kind of benchmark, basically. So you can, uh, you could look up the manpower gap in uh, Ivry, I think, or at least. Um, and you, and there's also in London the um, IMAX vault. Um, so these things have become uh, benchmarks in in a certain way. And I don't even really like that because it it it's gatekeeping for a start, but also it's it's potentially putting people at risk because they're aiming for something that is an exter- externally motivated and uh, um and can lead to to accidents and injury. So yeah, it's kind of like the CrossFit effect where you could take something like a simple push up but make it competitive, and then people will figure out a way to hurt themselves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's that's one of the the main reasons that I like to avoid competition in the park or has avoided competitions because uh it can be risky and if you add competition to risk terrible things happen um and you only have to look up the red bull out of motion there's been some awful awful um injuries done there that are very much against our ethos of longevity um because people push themselves a little bit further when competition uh gets involved right when we started this you made that joke about don't at me you're familiar with the internet lingo. You're down with the kids, right? So another problem with using that type of language of world class or like doing those type of things, it's just basic. Yeah. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. It's basic. It's you basic. Y'all don't need to do it. All right. Don't at me either. Okay. <laughs> but y'all don't need to do it. Yeah. Now, if someone wanted to get into parkour, what do they need to do? Um, well, I mean, on a practical level, um, go out and train but that's a terrible answer to that question. Some people stop their answer there, but um, you can start by exploring your local environment and having a go, jump off something, see see what you can see in your local environment. Um, I'd recommend looking up, say, if you go to Facebook or Google and type the name of your city and parkour in, you'll often find a Facebook group or um, some other community that you can either ask for advice or um, go along to a class. Um, you you by by no means need to go along to a class. Um, I would recommend doing it um, for as long as you need to to get an idea of what is safe or safer. Um, because as I said before, people that have been training parkour for a long time will be able to shortcut some of the um, maybe bad training ideas that that might be instinctive and show you how to maintain um, safe training and to focus on uh, long-term training as well. Um, And I would also recommend if you can getting in contact with people who uh, are like you or have had similar experiences and that might involve finding uh, women's communities, queer communities, or making sure that the the parkour community near you does have uh, values that you agree with, which can be really important in how comfortable you feel and how much belonging you feel in that in that space so um have an explore see if you can find local communities that you feel comfortable around um and if you can't you know the internet is a, is a tool can be used for good or ill so if you are if you are starting your training through stuff like um video tutorials try and make sure to get as much information as you can um before trying out any given any given technique so if there's absolutely nothing else then fine you can go on youtube but just take everything with a critical mind yes absolutely do you think people might be surprised when they look it up that there might actually be uh, more parkour around them than they think I think absolutely, um, particularly given uh, these developments by gymnastics, there are already some gymnastics gyms that are running um, parkour classes. Uh, I have seen some of their teaching materials and I would not recommend going to a 
gymnastics gym to learn parkour because of that. Um, but also given the um, explosion of stuff like Ninja Warrior and obstacle course racing, those obviously dovetail with parkour training a fair bit. So um, there are people providing parkour classes in, in most major cities in the world these days. Well, Kel, thank you for your time because I know <laughs> I, I know you didn't think we'd be going this long, but you know, you were blowing my mind. I didn't want to stop asking questions. And unlike other podcasts, I don't have any of those fake, we're running out of time, like as if it's a radio show. Yeah. I don't even know what that means when people say that. There is no time. We got, uh. <laughs> I mean, if I think the episode is too long, I could always edit it down shorter. So we don't do any of that. I guess the only constraint is your time, how much time you have. So I'm, I'm thankful you were so generous with your time. So where can people learn more about you and Melbourne in Motion? Um, great. Yeah. Well, we've got... Um... We have accounts on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you just search Melb in Motion, M E L B I N M O T I O N. Um, and you can also go to our website, www.melbinmotion.com. Um, and so we've got information there if anyone is listening or visiting, plans to visit Melbourne, come along to a class. Um, but we've also got a blog there with a with a fair amount of um of what i think is interesting stuff uh so i hope you all visit that can you say it in an american accent <laughs> melbourne in motion there we go <laughs> just so people don't get confused yeah absolutely so if anyone is going to visit um melbourne in australia at any point it is melbourne but yeah americans say melbourne and it annoys <laughs> us all all right cool thank you kel Thank you so much. I had a blast. Now that's the show. We've grown Southpaw purely from word of mouth, so that means it's all organic. So if you're already spreading the word, please continue to do so. If you've never done it, please consider telling your friends, sharing on social media, and also leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. This will make it easier for others to find us. And since this is independent media, Every dollar you pledge on Patreon goes a long way in the production of the show and will help us expand with more content on more platforms. Show your Southpaw solidarity by supporting us at patreon.com slash southpawpod. Until next time, goodbye.